Hi, my name is Jennifer Adams. I am the Editor-in-Chief with the Karunga Knowledge Hook Signature Leadership Series and thrilled to have you here. Um, I'm also the Executive Committee Member with Karunga and we are really happy to bring three partners together. Three partners have come together to uh, create the Social Emotional Learning Global Leadership Series because we know at this time of the global pandemic with COVID-19 and the resulting school closures that uh, what better time to be talking about social emotional learning. So here we are. Now, the first partner is the Knowledge Hook Signature Leadership Series. And if you take a look at uh, the three topics at the bottom, we cycle through Education 2030. So talking about what is happening in education systems around the world. Our second topic is future skills. So what are business and industry talking about and the skills that they would like our students to have coming into the workplace. And finally, improving math achievement. Uh, Knowledge Hook is a digital math company and they're doing great work in that area supporting teachers and students. Salzburg Global Seminar is the second uh, partner and they are an international nonprofit since 1947. Uh, their network is 36,000 fellows from a total of 180 countries. They're doing great work in the area of challenging current and for future leaders to shape a better world. And what great, what better topic to do that in than with uh, social emotional learning. They began in 2015 talking about social emotional learning and in March 2019, exactly one year ago actually, they created the Salzburg Statement on SEL and you're certainly welcome to jump onto that website and take a look at what they're saying. They continue to do great work in that area. The third partner is Karanga and Karanga is the Global Alliance for Social Emotional and Life Skills, Social Emotional Learning and Life Skills and it's a relatively new organization. We really encourage you to jump in and connect with us. We're doing work on advocacy, connected communities, implementation support, and cutting edge research. So we welcome you to uh, sign up and it's absolutely free of charge as uh, the other links are. We're really excited today to be able to say that we have uh, participants from five Canadian provinces, 12 states in the US and 32 countries. Uh, a huge shout out, we've got big groups today with us from the Philippines as well as from the Ukraine. So welcome to all of you. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the host for today, who is Luca Perry, a wonderful friend and colleague. He's doing great work out of Australia. He is the CEO and founder of The Learning Future, as well as he is a, an executive committee member with uh, Karanga. So welcome, Luca, and over to you. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, hello, dear colleagues from wherever you are in the world and wherever you're joining us from. Uh, we hope that you're well uh, and that you are taking time for self-care and for well-being and ultimately to really nourish the social connections in your own lives. What a moment that we find ourselves in. And uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be hosting what I think is one of a real series of vital conversations as we look at the way that education has been impacted along with the economies, the global health systems. I mean, this really is quite an incredible moment of disruption uh, in our history. And so, of course, that, that has really large implications for us in education in whatever role we might be filling, be that the vital role of being at the, at the classroom interface, uh, be leading a school, be leading a, an entire district as a superintendent, as a director of education, people in policy, parents, everyone is being impacted by this. And that's why I think this conversation about how we ensure that we are designing learning for meaning and connection is just very exciting. Um, at least I'm excited joining you here from South Australia. Uh, I have two wonderful colleagues um, from different parts of the world that, that will be first sharing some of their work, the big ideas that they've been exploring over the past decades, but also what's emergent for them? What are the kind of unanswered questions that they're, they're really working on and how might we move forward together to build back better, to actually take some of these insights to really reimagine and remake what education can be? Uh, the first of those is Barry Svigals. Barry and I met at the Stanford D School where he is the school safety fellow. He is a phenomenal thinker and doer. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more insight just before his session. 
but effectively Barry is one of these polymaths that has so many different interests and skills. Um, he is notably a, an award-winning architect and has founded his own firm. Uh, Sarah Mercer, Professor Sarah Mercer is joining us from Austria, from the University of Graz. Uh, Sarah similarly has an incredible career, really traversing across language learning, teacher well-being in particular, but also positive psychology and how we can use all of those things together to ensure that, that learners are getting powerful experiences and the people delivering the learning are equally supported. We have three key questions that we're focusing on today. And they are really about this opportunity for learning as, as you know, um, a vehicle for, for meaning connection. The first, how might we design learning for creativity, care and capabilities, both today and tomorrow? How might we redefine the role of the educator to support more powerful learning? What does this mean for the role of a teacher today? And how might we build back better the experience of schooling for all learners? Just some quick housekeeping. The way we've designed this series is that we're gonna have 15 minutes of insights from Professor Mercer. Then we're gonna have, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a quick prompt to reflect. Then we'll have 15 minutes of insights from Barry. And after that, we'll, we'll kind of leap into a Q&A. Please, uh, on the chat boxes, I can see people saying hello from all over the world. Do start to share your thoughts, even during those presentations. Any questions I'll take note on, we'll finish with a Q&A before we all move back into whichever way that we're contributing to the education ecosystem. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah. Um, Sarah and I have known each other for a number of years now. She is simply one of the best thinkers I have met. The way that she can connect different ideas and particularly I would say her world leading work in teacher well-being and the interface with social emotional learning and English language teaching or language teaching more generally. I think she brings a huge amount to these conversations about you know, how might we redefine what the experience is for learners, but also crucially for the people that are leading learning across our systems, sectors, and nations. So Sarah, it's fantastic to have you on the call. Thank you so much for taking us through some of your ideas. That's really kind and very, very generous, Luca. Far too generous, in fact, but thank you. Uh, thank you also to the three partners for giving me this opportunity to kind of take stock and have a little think about things that are important to me um in designing learning for meaning and connection so this is kind of a chance for me to have a little bit of a wish list kind of thing so i'm going to share some thoughts to you um this is a great quote that i came across and some of you have maybe seen this elsewhere just let me get rid of this box at the corner it's in my way um i think this is a great thing when we rush back to normal let's consider what's worth going back to so have a think about it's not that everything we have currently is not worth keeping we've got a lot of great things going on in education but it's about thinking about which things can we improve, which things can we retain, which can we build on, and which do we maybe need to have a little bit of a think about. Okay, hold on, I've got to get my... Okay, so I decided to kind of do it this way that I would look at three kind of key core determinants of education, the curriculum, the teacher, and the learner. And all of these are embedded in an ecosystem. So I'm talking in a kind of abstract way about them, but you have to always consider what is appropriate in the particular culture, context, institution, and so on. So we're talking about these in a little bit of a distracted, abstracted way, but that's not really how they work. So let's look at the teacher first. Typically, teachers are in the profession for intrinsic motives. So you know the joke, nobody goes into teacher for the great salary and the fantastic fame and glory that you're going to get. And what we've seen during the pandemic crisis is that teachers have been utterly fantastic in adapting spontaneously with no preparation, no resources, no time, and very little thanks very often, and just getting themselves, throwing themselves into it and just getting on with making the most, making the best of the educational situation. And they do it with dedication. So you know what this really gives to me? These are professionals. Teachers are trained as professionals, they are acting as professionals, and they should be treated accordingly. And sadly, in many education systems, that is not yet the case. Um, we all talk about flattening the curve at the moment, so I'm talking about flattening the hierarchy. Let's give teachers more autonomy. Let's recognize them as the professionals that they are. Let, us, let them just get on with their jobs and do what they're good at. Um, give them more autonomy to make the decisions themselves, not looking over their shoulders the whole time. We really need to work consciously as a community to raise their status within society, how they're portrayed in the media, within our institutions, and also through policy. 
we need to make sure that teachers are being given the status they deserve. It's fundamental for their well-being, fundamental for the respect in the job, fundamental for the way that they teach. And we have to be taking more conscious action to protect them as our most valuable resource in education. Uh, that's not just a personal opinion, although it is. But in fact, if you look at Hattie and you look at all the studies, teachers make a massive difference in education. They are the thing that matters. So we should be taking greater care of them. We should be investing in them. We should be protecting them. We should be asking them, what can we do for you? What can we do to support you? How can we strengthen where you're at? Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing, as Luca kindly and generously pointed out earlier, has been to look at teacher well-being and talking about what teachers need in kind of support and how status affects their well-being and so on. And this is a quote from the book that I had the pleasure of writing with a dear colleague of mine is, being a dedicated educator should not come at the expense of your own well-being. And one of the things that we find is that because teachers are so committed to what they do, they often work way and beyond the call of duty at cost, at personal cost and cost to their well-being. And yet we know that teachers who have high levels of well-being teach better and teach more effectively. So taking care of the teacher is my number one wish. Let's have a little bit of a look at the learner and think about one of the problems in education that we noted certainly before the virus and maybe going on. Um, we found two thirds of the students in school are bored. Um, only 47%, so less than half, are engaged. 29% are not engaged and 24 are actively disengaged. And the, 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 the level of engagement decreases as you go through schooling levels. So that's a huge problem because if you are not engaged, you're not learning quite simply. So we need to be conscious about what engagement is. How does it function? How do we get learners engaged? Um, and this is a statement from some researchers. Um, engagement is the holy grail of learning. It's the access to learning. If you're going to learn, you have to be engaged. You have to have your cognition engaged, your emotions engaged. You have to behaviorally be engaged. It's not about compliance. It's not about just going through the motions. It's about being committed and invested in your own learning. And that's quite a, a challenge for contemporary education, to put it mildly. Um, one of the things that we've also been working on with some colleagues is looking at engagement. Now, we've been looking very specifically at engagement in language learning classrooms, but I need to make it clear because I know that many of you are not from that context. Um, we divided the book into two areas. We have a series of principles. So guiding insights about what are the principles of engagement. And then we have action steps that are really meant specifically for language education. And so I'm going to talk about some of the principles now that apply generally in any form of education, not just in language education. We have a tripartite model. We talk about the fact that you need learners to be willing to engage first and foremost. And that's where social emotional learning plays an enormous role. They've got to feel psychologically safe. They've got to feel confident. They've got to feel they can do this, that this is something they can achieve. Then the teachers and the classroom and the school have to do things to trigger that engagement and then you've got to keep it. So it's no good having all singing, all dancing tricks to trigger their engagement if you can't keep it. Because only sustained engagement over time is going to lead to meaningful, purposeful learning. Um, we've looked at just, a, I'm just, put a few of the principles here just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that you can think about. And I'm very conscious of the fact that I don't want to overstay my welcome time wise. So I'm going to make sure that I don't dawdle too much. The willingness to engage is that kind of foundations that we need for learners to feel that they are safe, that they are confident that the teacher is invested in them, that they are able to learn. Triggering an engagement is about getting learners emotionally invested, helping them to see the purpose and relevance, and that's something I'll come back to if we remember that for in a moment. Getting them curious and interested in learning. Curiosity is the most undervalued thing. If we can get people curious, my goodness, is that a powerful tool for learning? And then we have to maintain that engagement, and we've got to keep it going. And that's about maximizing learner autonomy, giving them agency, helping them see a sense of progress. They have to feel they're getting somewhere. Think about all the insights we've got from gaming. Why does gaming, why is gaming so addictive? That teaches us really important lessons about the process and the psychology of engagement. And then keeping learners active. So engagement comes from being actively involved and actively engaged in what you're trying to learn. The best forms of, best, most engaging approaches here are things like project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, problem-based learning. I would love to see more of this. 
more into disciplinary work, loosening up the very rigid school structures that we have and letting learners explore topics and themes and projects and bringing things together in a safe and active way. And let's finally end on a quick look at my wishes for the curriculum. So the what, we've looked at the two key stakeholders. Let's have a little look now. Now the purpose of school, what is the purpose of school? My God, what a question, hey? Um, I don't suppose I'm gonna answer that in two minutes that I've got left. But the purpose of schooling has been a question since Aristotle. Why do we send kids to school? What's the purpose of them being there? Um, Martin Seligman did a really interesting survey. Maybe you wanna post your ideas here in the box about this. And he asked parents two questions. In two words or less, what do you want for you and your children in life? That's the first question. Maybe you wanna post in the chat box some of your thoughts on that. And then the second one, in two words or less, what do you think schools teach? And maybe you wanna post in the box what you think the responses were for that. Now it doesn't take much to see where I'm going with this or where in fact Seligman was going with this. So he found that people responded these kind of things. But what they wanted for their kids, they wanted them to be happy, they wanted them to be confident, they wanted to, to experience kindness, health, well-being. Um, essentially they wanted their kids to be happy and to flourish in life. And in two words or less, what they thought schools taught were things like achievement, thinking skills, conformity is a bit more worrying, literacy, mathematics, and so on. Um, tools of accomplishment. Now it's not to say it's either or, it can be both. But I think it's fair to say that in many education systems, we're seriously neglecting the first part and putting an undue emphasis on the second part here. There's a discrepancy. So one of the changes that has been taking place globally is about teaching global skills, or as I know that Karanga talks about life skills, this has been a replacement of the traditional 21st century four C's. So the four C's were things like um, critical thinking, communication, creativity, and collaboration, and of course, digital literacy, which is mm -hmm. a whole other area. And now we have broadened that up because the critique was, of course, that that was like factory system thinking, industrial age thinking. That was preparing people for the workplace. It wasn't necessarily preparing them for life more broadly conceived. And now we have broadened this with global skills to think about things like how can we teach the skills of well-being to kids? How can we teach them about sustainable living? How can we teach them the sense of responsibility as global citizenship? And these are now in curricula globally and they're transversal skills, so the responsibility of all teachers. Um, I'm not going to talk too long about this conscious for time, but there are various reasons and ways that this can be done. Fundamentally, it's because this takes us back to making it relevant for learners. It enhances the purpose and the real world relevance of education. It means that we're not just preparing academics or preparing for the workplace, we're preparing people for life. And it very much is an equity issue. Equity within the nation and equity globally. Um, how it can be done, it can be done in two ways. There's what we call the dual strand approach, which is this picture of this little cute guy with the DNA here. You have your academic goals and you have your life skill goals. And you can try to teach them in an integrated way all the way through the curricula. And I could talk at length about why just having an add-on course for life skills is not a sustainable way of doing it. It doesn't generate the kind of mindset in people that this is a fundamental part of education. And you can have strong and weak forms from just introducing critical reflective questions and texts to full-blown project-based learning. Fundamentally, what I would hope is that with an emphasis on global skills, we put people, we put their lives, we put their flourishing at the heart of the curriculum. And that's all what these wonderful partners here are about, about thinking about social emotional learning for the teachers, for the learners, for parents and for the whole community, in fact. Um, my summary that you're going to get these slides afterwards, so you'll see that. Teachers, please, can we start treating them as professionals, flatten the hierarchy, give them autonomy, enhance their status, respect them for the great job that they're doing, and look after their well-being. Learners, we've got to get them engaged, we've got to give them responsibility for learning, give them autonomy, give them agency, create psychological safety and confidence for all learners, maximize the agency for them to take control and be empowered learners give them opportunities to take part in things like project-based learning and learning for life, loosen up the curriculum a little bit. Um, and in terms of the curriculum, for me, it's be about teaching more global skills, doing it more systematically. It's happening in part, and it very much depends on sort of individual teachers, but there's not a systematic approach to this in terms of teacher training, pre-service and in-service. So teaching global skills, Ensuring that school stays relevant, fit for purpose, relevant for the learners, but also answering that question of why we send people to school. 
supports learning for life and well-being for individuals and for global citizenship and it also fosters social equity. The globe, when you teach global skills, you empower individuals, you create people to have opportunities within the nation, but also looking internationally at some of the disparity that exists. Guys, thank you so much for your time. I hope I've been able to give you a flavor of my wish list. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, virtual applause, I'm sure. Uh, some fantastic concepts. And I, I really love this idea of the ecosystem. You know, and the more that we think about this, I think, it really speaks to this moment when schools, the old provocation was, what would we do if schools closed tomorrow, you know, or weren't compulsory? Well, in many respects, many parts of the world, you know, 1.4 billion plus learners being impacted in this way. Uh, so we're going to unpack that ecosystem in particular and kind of the why, the what, and the how, because the how, of course, is kind of the, the, the is where context has become so, so key. And those principles really can turn into methods or methodologies that kind of be can be unpacked a bit more so thank you so much for sharing um that amazing wish list um uh and it, it dawned on me as i introduced barry that this really is perhaps in our lifetime the largest opportunity to reimagine what the educational experience might be to reskill entire nations and not just entire communities or schooling districts and so it's going to be fascinating to see all of the the ways and the different approaches that different organizations take one of the amazing organizations uh, is the D School at Stanford. And Barry is, as you all know, the School Safety Fellow. Uh, he comes from an incredible career in architecture. But to say that he's an architect, I think, doesn't do you any, you know, um, doesn't, do you, doesn't do you full credit, Barry, to be honest. A musician, artist, really almost a well-being designer in so many different ways. And so what I, what I find so interesting in speaking with you, Barry, is your connection between kind of the physical built environments, but also the way that we can bring kind of the emotional arcs into an experience as well, particularly with some of your, um, the, your past very challenging work that you've done. Um, for example, people may have seen in your bio having redesigned the Sandy Hook School after the school shooting tragedy and doing so to make a school incredibly safe, but also emotionally safe. And, and how one walks that line, I think, is, is very well, Hopefully you'll illuminate as part of your conversation today. So um, Barry, over to you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Aluka. And thank you, Sarah. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to compliment what, um, what Sarah said, because what we're talking about is, um, if I can uh, get to my slides here. Um, Hope we're, uh, I hope we're going to uh, be, uh, in a way, talking about two sides of the same thing. We're talking about how we can make a place for education. And there's an interrelationship, obviously, a powerful one between the two. Um, the second line there of making a place for students to become themselves is an extraordinarily important thing. And Sarah, you were touching on so many dimensions of of what that is. What you're looking at, by the way, is the facade of the Sandy Hook School. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the creation of that school uh, from two different angles. One was the way in which it was created um, and the spaces that came out of that, that process. What we realize is that in moments of crisis, we so often forget what is most important. And I'm so excited to see so many people from around the world this message could not be more important now. It's more important than ever. It certainly was important when we began designing the Sandy Hook School where uh, the trauma of that event shattered the community. And we began with a question similar to the one that uh, Sarah, you were posing. Uh, we asked them what it is they loved about their homes, their neighborhoods, and their communities. And that reconnection formed the groundwork for being able to make informed and appropriate decisions about how the learning in the school was going to happen. Um, and this is where it began. This is the very first meeting of gathering at the, the Sandy Hook School. There's so many things about this image that are important. One, that everyone is a circle. And there are quite a lot of people, actually, and including as many dimensions of the community as possible was essential to have a voice and also be able to work through 
what had happened to everyone. This is uh, not dissimilar to what's happening actually right now. So much has been fragmented and communities dissolved. There is an opportunity right now to begin to remember our communities and reestablish them. And, and that's happening almost naturally. This conference is an example of that, for example. And I see the things that are happening in the chat and I, I, I'm trying not to be distracted by them because there's so many great comments coming in. Um, that we need to remember that we're, we have so much in common and particularly when we ask that question of what we wish for our children. And uh, relevant to what uh, Sarah was saying, of course the teachers are, uh, need to be empowered. And at the same time, we need to remember that all of us are responsible for empowering them. All of us are responsible for the education of our children, not that we are, ourselves are uh, in the schools, but we're part of the continuum um, of caring for our kids. And so often um, that responsibility is abrogated and, and there's a finger pointing to teachers that they should be doing this, they should be doing that, superintendents should be doing this. Everyone is responsible. Um, and it was true uh, in the recreation of the Sandy Hook School. Uh, involving the community is essential. We had a particular um, problem in the United States and still do which has to do with uh, acts of extreme violence. They are extraordinarily rare. It is three times more likely that you'll be hit by lightning than be involved in a school shooting. It is a hundred times more likely that a child will take their own life than be involved in a school shooting. We need to understand that the metric of well-being is, is so uh, out of whack with the fear of uh, these rare acts of violence around the world, and I can see uh, uh, the chats from around the world. This is thankfully not something that's happening elsewhere. But what is the lesson from this? Um, the lesson is to focus on the children themselves and not to create places that are overreacting to making them so secure that they look like this. This actually is a school in New Haven that we took down. It's not a detention center in the Soviet Union, um, it, um, or in the United States for that matter. Um, that uh, the reaction in urban environments in the 1970s was to make a school that unfortunately became more like a prison and not surprisingly, the kids inside felt like they were in prison and this cycle of going from the prison and school to actual prisons began. This was a school that replaced it um, and full of glass. The um, police who patrolled that area felt, oh, you'll never be able to do this, have glass on the streets. Well, in fact, you can, because if you include the community in the, the decision-making around the school, this is the type of thing that can, um, can happen. The underlying um, uh, lesson through this is that uh, school safety and well-being in schools is a complex and interrelated problem, and every aspect of it needs to be considered. Everything is related. And so the solutions need to be multifaceted. I'm going to give you one example from the Sandy Hook School. Um, in front of the school, going all along the facade, is a rain garden. And that rain garden is a teaching opportunity for the ecology of the, um, in the Connecticut region. Um, the kids come out, they learn in it. Uh, it also happens to be a protective barrier to the school. Um, those bridges across uh, to the school, there are three places where the kids come in. They are metaphors for the bridges that are in the town of Newtown uh, in Sandy Hook. So there's an uh, uh, evocation of the history of, uh, of Newtown, which is so important to connect children to the place in which they live. Uh, and this slide will change. So this is a definition that came from Kevin Gogan. It was the director of safety and wellness in, in San Francisco. Um, being able to bring your whole self to school. Um, that includes such a wide dimension of what uh, being safe in a school, as Luca was saying earlier, it's not just physically being safe, it's feeling as if you're safe and be feeling as if you are cared for. It. So wellness is in fact the most important com uh, component of feeling safe and in fact being safe. So a place that they can call their own, the children um, need to feel 
as if they belong to a place. They also need to understand it. And the whole process of coming into the school, which by the way, came from that collective design process. Everyone was involved in making the decisions of what this building looked like. And you see that wavy facade, which looks rather strange, not like a regular school. That comes from the images that um, people brought in of the town, of the undulating uh, canopies of trees that is a, uh, uh, a sign of Newtown, actually. When you come over the hill, you see this undulating um, uh, canopy of trees with the spires of the church uh, and town hall coming above it. Um, the children come in and are brought along the entire facade, this curved facade like an embrace of the children. They experience the entire facade and you see that the safety um, of barrier of the, of the bus drop off is important not only for the kids getting off, but it also pulls away from the school and allows the school to have a kind of front porch, which was, was the notion. So remembering the scale of, the, uh, of our users and creating a home for learning couldn't be more important. Uh, when you think about homeschooling now, and this is uh, an image from last week um, in the home of uh, some, uh, uh, the daughter of some friends of ours, and you might notice that the dog is learning too in the corner. Um, and somehow this is happening now. This is happening within the home. And to Sarah's point and Luca's point about how we can bring this forward, how can, in, in coming back to school, can we remember that there's a place for children and a scale for children, particularly small ones? This school is broken down into different zones, and this illustrates these, the elementary school on the left-hand side, and then two other um, uh, parts of the school, such that they understand their piece within the larger whole. And the connection to the outside uh, comes through those courtyards that open back to the trees. You might have seen that the, the school was pushed right into the, the trees at the back of the site that connect to a park. The idea of the school was learning in nature, learning in the trees. Biophilia is something that probably most of you are familiar with. It is simply the profound connection that we have with nature, our love of nature. There couldn't be anything um, uh, that connects kids more directly to their learning than nature. It's seeing and being seen and witnessing the creative world. And I happened to read this just this morning, coincidentally opened a page of the book that I was reading, and it said, always try to keep a patch of sky above your life, little boy. You have a soul in you of rare quality, an artist nature. Never let it starve for lack of what it needs. If we can provide that for children, we'll answer that question of what we, what we wish for, for our children. And finally, this see into the seeing into the school. If you look right through, you'll see the trees in the background. And when you come into that front foyer, you are back outside again. This learning in the trees is connecting the children all the time to who they are as human beings and how they're related to the planet on a much larger level. And they get a sense of scale that is different than the one that we're typically giving them. It's not flat, it's connected to a whole community that experiences the earth and everyone on this chat experiences the earth. And if the kids do, they have a connection to everyone else on the earth. And we shouldn't forget in the design of the school's whimsy and delight. One of the things that um, we, we added to the school was artwork that, um, that was symbolic of the, the town. And the other thing was to create these um, tree houses that um, there are two of them that the kids can go into. And, and see into the, the birds that are um, nesting in the trees that are not more than 50 feet away. Um, this is what children delight in. And if we can provide that and remember that education must be fueled by that delight and provide environments that, that encourage that, um, the teachers then are supported. I wanna say briefly that our course that Luca, by the way, um, uh, participated in, was called Safe by Design from Fear to Joy in Learning Environments. Um, and this talked mostly about school safety, but it focused in the end on wellness. And the question that we wanna take forward and what the current opportunity is, 
with social emotional learning more important than ever. And this is the one thing that we hear in all the research that we're doing literally right now um, with at home schooling, the social emotional uh, component is paramount. Kids need to feel safe in order to learn. So hopefully we can move this conversation now from fear to joy, such that when we build back better, we'll carry that into the new environment. So thank you very much. Um, and I can't wait to hear this conversation. Harry, thank you. And lucky that you get to take part in the conversation further. I mean, yeah. I really, I think <laughs> it just provides a different insight to us. I, I wanna pick up a couple of things before we get to a few questions. Um, and so to all of you listening uh, from wherever you are, do please, um, write any questions, any insights you want us to explore further. We've probably got another 15 or so minutes just under um, to kind of engage in a bit of a Q and A between us, um, but also with all of you. Uh, and it's this piece around belonging. And I heard it in both of your, your presentations, ultimately, the idea of belonging and care. And it does kind of pick up one of the questions, you know, the idea that how do we move from, I mean, my, my, one of my bugbears right now is we're all talking about social distancing. We shouldn't be. We should be saying physical distancing with social connectedness because if we, we know the role, you know, what's the number one thing kids say they miss about being at school? Their friends right now in some of the surveys that we're seeing. And that's because of the, the sense of being part, belonging to that community. And so with, you know, hundreds of millions of, of learners now doing, as you say, Barry, this kind of remote learning. Um, that sense of connectedness and belonging, I think is being done really, really well in some spaces and it's not being done well in, in others. So how do we, this is my first question to you both, how do we, you know, for, for the many countries that are still under significant lockdown or restrictions or shelter in place, how do we ensure there is connectedness and belonging in the learning process right now across districts? Teachers are doing their best, but you know, how do we ensure that, that there aren't people slipping through the cracks, there aren't people isolated, um, and that no one really feels alone um, because they can't physically convene? Sarah, you wanna jump in first and I'll... I can do. Um, I, I think one of the things I'd like to mention that's been actually very telling in the teachers that I've been talking to, I think Luca knows that we're doing some research on teacher well-being at the moment, sort of ongoing during the crisis, is some kids are actually flourishing. Mm. Now, some kids are actually flourishing at home and doing better than they were in school. Now, that's got to raise some really important questions about what's going on in school, that they're actually happier. And what Barry said really struck home with me in respect to these kids is that they are safer and happier at home than they are in school. And they are flourishing at the moment. Quite a, a number of teachers that are involved in our study have reported that some of the kids are actually blossoming. Not all of them, of course, and that a lot of kids are missing the social context. But um, so we, we, this idea of safety, um, one of the key concepts about teachers building relationships with learners is psychological safety or pedagogical caring. So mm. when teachers are able to show that they care for learners, not only as individual, but they care for their learning and they care for their progress. And many teachers are very good at communicating this. And so all the skills that teachers have in terms of building relationships with learners, building relationships among their learners, they have to continue doing this, but they have to do it in a different way. So it requires these little, one of my colleagues explained that she said, just having a smiley emoticon conversation help build up that connection with one of the learners that was a little bit harder to reach. So it's not that we've forgotten all the skills about how to build relationships. We just have to transfer them to a different ecology, Luca, a different mm. environment. But I was very interested to think about the social connection that is facilitated in the kind of buildings that, that Barry was showing us, which is fantastic. These communal spaces that you were showing um, and that sense of safety of being at home. What's interesting, there's so many things that uh, could be said uh, about this, and Sarah, those are wonderful comments. Some of the things that we unearthed in the research that we we're doing right now, by the way, we just had a, finished a 24-hour uh, hackathon to, to help at-home uh, educators, overnight educators, actually. Um, and the things that we can build better forward is how parents are now engaged in their children's education. 
which is a wonderful dimension. At the same time, not all parents are uh, equipped in the same way. And I'm afraid that this, this time has revealed all the systemic inequities that um, exist out there. And the statistics that you showed, Sarah, I'm afraid are only accelerated in this, this time period. Uh, many of the kids don't have technology um, so that they're not connected. Um, families have um, students that are at multiple ages and two parents that are working from home or, or are a part of essential services and can't be there. Uh, enormously stressful for, um, for parents. How can we begin to support um, education in so many different ways uh, at home, of course, but how that uh, at-home learning, by the way, can be brought back, as you were saying, Sarah, how can that be brought back into, um, into the schools themselves? And one of the dimensions, as I was saying earlier, is that parents now realize more about their children's education now than ever before. The other thing is very simple things are possible right now. Going outside, for example. Uh, now, maybe you, can't so you have to be socially distant, but you can go outside. Um, and that connection to the outdoors could not be more important. And all the families that we uh, talked to said that was one of the most important dimensions of the day, instead of cooping kids up in school all day long. One simple thing. So I'll go back to you, Luca, to keep going in this. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking through some of the fantastic questions here. Um, I'm going to just throw you a couple and then see if we can unpack them, because there, there are some key themes. One of the themes is equity. Because I think, Sarah, and I'm sure your research is you know, showing this as well, here in Australia, there are some schools where a quarter of the students haven't even logged in to access one lesson. And that's largely because of access issues, but it's also partially they're voting to say, I don't see the relevance here. There's, there's a lot, of, lot around the equity piece. So what, what do we do when you know, not, every, not every young person has the connection through technology to be able to access at the same level as some others that's one of the questions um one of the uh, one question here for you barry i imagine is you know what do we do when we have industrialized kind of architecture in our school our school is what it is how do we kind of retrofit to kind of make it uh, and make the space feel more connected uh, and perhaps more connected to the world also is another great question um, um <laughs> and one final one i just want to flag as well and see if we can pick up this is the conversation do we think happy students learn more and are more engaged? You know, what's, what, is, what, what is there about that emotional piece, you know, with the social and emotional learning that we're speaking of? You know, what, what, how do we activate, you know, the, the notion of engagement, Sarah? How do we, you know, think about the emotional arc of a lesson or an experience or a space and how that actually impacts? What do we know from the research so far about that? So Barry, give us, a, give us an a sense about how we, we're stuck with a classroom, you know, and teachers do remarkable jobs of turning them into all sorts of things. But what's your kind of, what's your insight on that? Well, what's interesting is it's um, when we go into schools that um, are impoverished in a certain way from the uh, perspective of our architecture, we're humbled by the fact that um, students and teachers can transform them amazingly to become educational places for themselves. So as we make these, uh, these schools from scratch, uh, we remember that in these other environments, they can be transformed. And one of the most important dimensions of that is student engagement. I don't think I stressed that enough that we need to empower our students to be part of their educational process. And, and that empowerment can extend to understanding the environment in which they're um, being taught, assessing it, which they do incredibly well. Um, Luke, you asked that question because you know we partnered with a uh, K-8 school in Oakland, um, a school that wasn't terribly designed, but wasn't um, very well designed in another, uh, another respect. Um, these students were empowered to do something about that. And mm -hmm. just in the empowerment, they had a feeling of uh, well-being from having control over their environment. And they were very sensitive to actually how their school was and what they could do about it. Um, so I think there are things that can be done. Sarah, any insights? Um, I, I was gonna come back to something that you kind of flagged up earlier that I think um, fits, certainly connects both the things that Barry and I are talking about is that when we talk about education taking place in an ecology, 
you're not just talking about the fifth, you know, there's a whole network of people involved in education in the community in terms of the parents. When you're talking about social equity, we need to talk about why there are those disparities where, you know, it goes, goes way beyond just the educational situation. And that's why, you know, I think Barry had a fantastic quote about, you know, complex problems such as education. Um, you know, Luke and I have had many a conversation about complex dynamic systems. Complex systems like an education system cannot be solved with easy solutions. There's no easy quick fixes to this. But there are lots of places where we can learn that have maximum impact. So when you think about a complex dynamic system, you find the part of the system that is susceptible to the biggest impact and you make a change there. And so looking at what parts of the system are going to accelerate and the teacher learner relationship is absolutely essential building up those social emotional skills for teachers to look after themselves, to be able to model those skills, but also then to develop them amongst their learners and in their groups. For me, those are sort of essential parts of that. Mm -hmm. And democratizing throughout the system, getting everybody engaged. So, you know, Barry was talking about getting the parents, getting the community involved, getting learners involved in thinking about their own education. That's the sort of essence of project-based learning. That's the essence of what engagement is. Engagement is being actively involved feeling you have a sense of responsibility and control over what happens to you, making a difference and seeing a purpose and, and a relevance to yourself and your life in what's happening to you. So those are very fundamental places to begin um, in empowering learners to become more actively involved, empowering teachers to not just be ticking boxes and being monitored, but actually to be able to make active decisions, have an impact on what happens, um, not just in the confines of their classroom, but within the institution more broadly. So I think some ecological thinking helps us to reflect on the complexity and look at some of the pressure points um, and some of the hubs of influence and where we can start maximizing the impact. There are no quick fix solutions in education. We all know that. So it's about looking maybe for the points which maximize the impact that we can achieve. There's a, there's, it's, I mean, that's absolutely spot on. The, the idea, I think, the metaphor really works here, Sarah. The idea, you know, people talk about, still, we listen to the language that we use. And as a language expert, I'm sure you could speak to this. But, you know, Barry, you and I have talked about this as well. You know, what are the levers we can pull? How do we put the cogs together? You know, these are all mechanistic metaphors. And I think, you know, we've just seen a great example from you, Barry, about the ecology, bringing nature in. Like, how do we think like an organic system and the different conditions, which are always holistic? And I think it's just a much better, you know, Rather than saying like, which levers do I pull so this kid learns, right? Or so I teach this child, which is even worse. It's what are the conditions that we need to put in place in an environment that enable this young person to thrive, you know, cognitively, socially, and emotionally. And the, the physical space is one of them. And, you know, as is the teacher role, et cetera. Well, it's funny you said the teacher role, because one of the things that we deliberately did in the book on engagement is we changed this and we talked and, and Barry, this will hopefully kind of speak to you and it sort of we steal the idea from also this kind of notion is we talked about teachers as designers of learning experiences. Mm. Now, you know, it's what you just said, it might sound like semantics, but it, for me, it's a massive shift in thinking that you're not teaching. It's not this transmission model we've got to get away from, but it's about designing experiences of learning. And that's a much more holistic view. It's much more organic. It takes in the whole person, but it also looks at the system in which that learning is taking place. So I think this notion of design um, can be adapted and thought about in terms of how we design learning experiences from an ecological perspective. That's, a, a, again, the language is, is very important. You're talking about experiences of learning. Um, that is a very different metric. And if we look at the assessment that goes on in schools today, mm -hmm. they're not measuring for that. Uh, they're not measuring for the experience of learning. Um, and th this points to, once again, this ecology of, uh, of the educational environment is so interconnected. There was a wonderful question in there uh, about um, whether we have any correlation between the design of the schools and uh, emotional well well being and um, I'm, it's it's now disappeared up into the, uh, yeah. the questions. But um, having to do with that, it's a wonderful question. And lamentably, the answer is directly no. Not in education. Um, there's much more research in in um, health in health and um, uh, hospitals uh, with respect to uh, people's. Um, progress towards uh, well-being in 
traumatic situations uh, in hospitals, that the environment, no question, has an effect on it. I'm sure that's true in schools, but our measurement of it is very, very um, uh, difficult because everything is interrelated. Um, there isn't just a correlation between the environment and then, and then um, the kids. There's, of course, the teaching. There are the parents. There's the, there's the community, the urban environment. All sorts of things contribute to the quality of education, um, and they all have to be considered. That's, that's the thing. We, we need to see this as um, an interrelationship between all these different components um, to appreciate really what we can do about education. And I'm just going to jump in to just report on our, with some of the research we've been doing about teacher well-being and talking about what conditions do we provide, what resources do we provide for teachers. And we've got a number of teachers talking in various schools across the globe that they don't even have toilet paper in their toilets. Now, that may seem like a small thing, but boy, is that a signal of your worth that your institution doesn't feel the need to provide you with decent toilet facilities and toilet paper, never mind coffee machines. So the, the way that an environment communicates to its stakeholders, its members, its participants is huge about mm, how it's simple. valuing, appreciating, and esteeming the people that work there. And I think that a lot of schools have a long way to go in communicating that they care for their teachers in terms of the facilities, the resources and support that they offer. And I mean, also in very physical terms. I, uh, I don't wanna make light of that situation, Sarah, but we've sold out of toilet paper in Australia, basically, because <laughs> everyone has been panic buying, we literally rationing everything. It's kind of, it's an absurd thing that's going on. Um, but this is a very, that's a really good point. And I, I would expand that. It's not just the school symbolism, it's the societal piece. And this is the whole idea that really, if, if the crisis has illuminated anything, perhaps it is what is truly essential. And the educational experience, not the achievement process, but the educational experience is, is being now seen as complex. And um, I mean, many parents are sharing all sorts of insights about how difficult it is to homeschool. I think that's actually of benefit for a, a, the empathic lens. Um, I do want to pick up one quick question here that says, how do we build this mindset? I mean, Sarah, you are training teachers uh, right now. Barry works with a range of different educators across the work that he does, uh, as do I. So what, what is, how do we tap into the mindset? You know, how do we actually help promote an attitude that, thinks about learning as this kind of experience, thinks like a designer rather than the kind of transmitter of, of knowledge or skill. I think it has to start in teacher education and there's a lot of problems there about where the priorities lie and how much time is allocated to things like social emotional skills, uh, well-being skills and so on. I think there's a, a, a huge problem there. Um, I think, <laughs> Where, where do you begin to unravel this? Um, I think in teacher education, we see that the learners, the students we're working with, the pre-service teachers, are already there. They have this mindset. That's a lot of the reason they became educators. But it's knocked out of them by the system because they just get drowned in admin and paperwork and test scores, which is communicating a very, very different message. And it's not the reason that most of them went into education in the first place. So mm -hmm. I... I sadly, maybe it's a rather, but I sadly think, I think that they have that intrinsic mindset. Many of the teachers begin with that. I think the system, if we're talking about ecologies, I think the system and how it communicates what is valued in education. And then it's back to the point that Barry made about test scores and, um, you know, being evaluated on, on, on outcome metrics. Those kind of things are communicating a very, very different message. And teachers have to conform to that system. They have to work within that system. So I think many educators would welcome a system that enabled them to do what they went into the profession for in the first place. I think breaking down those, um, those silos uh, is, is a beginning. Um, when you talk about the system, the, the difficulty is that each of the pieces are, are, are not connected. Um, and and as you say, the, the things that we, we want to have happen in school um, are not the ones that are being communicated. Um, so how do we change that? I, I think that it's, of course, going to be an incremental uh, a change. Uh, we have to hit it on a lot of different levels. One of the ways that the D school has, uh, has been working at it is picking out one particular thing like assessment 
and coming at it from an entirely different angle. Um, hacking is a, a term that uh, I'm learning all these terms at the D school. Hacking is a term <laughs> that, that means trying to get into, um, put a wedge into the systemic uh, onslaught um, and create change by revolution within. Um, and they've created a thing called the puzzle bus. Um, and, and these escape rooms that are essentially as puzzle bus is about is a way of teaching collaboration, creativity, um, and all kinds of things that are essential in education um, along with everything else that's going on. And um, that's such an exciting little thing. Another is shadow a student. They have a superintendent spending an entire day with a student doing absolutely everything that student does. It opens up a whole world where it breaks down these silos between the administrators and the people who are, in fact, the clients. <laughs> so they begin to learn something that's entirely different. And that creates the, a systemic change. Mm. Great example, Barry. The, the, the idea of really tapping into lived experience, I think, and leading with empathy, you know, asking good questions. And uh, we're, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So uh, I want you to think about what is your kind of one take home message that you would love to leave this community with? Because um, that I think is where we might end the conversation today. Um, I really think about this idea of asking great questions. And now is probably my take, my takeaway, my pondering is what are, the, what are the best questions we need to be asking ourselves right now? And they aren't some of the questions that I've been hearing from different leaders, from, that teachers have said, others have said, you know, like, how do I stop my students from muting me on Zoom or from changing their background? You know, that's, that's not the question to ask. The question is, what is the experience that the learner is having? How, how connected, how much do they feel they're being cared for, that teacher-student dynamic? And how motivated are they? Have we triggered their engagement by creating those things? I mean, those, that for me is like, how can we ask better questions, particularly right now, so that we don't actually lose what is probably the biggest opportunity we've seen in decades to reimagine, I think, what education could be. That's my take home. So, Barry, Sarah, what's some final thoughts from each of you? Build back better. Harvest everything that we're learning right now. And do whatever we can to bring it back into school so the kids are engaged. Uh, and all the good things that are happening now, familiar relationships that can be taken back into school um, can continue. Mm. Love it. Um, I suppose I, my message is, is can, we, can we keep this vision of an ecology in the forefront of our minds? That naturally education systems are oriented towards the learner, they always will be and they should be, but we mustn't overlook the role of the teacher. Everybody needs caring for, and we need to care for the learners. They need to feel cared for, but so do the teachers as well. When teachers are cared for, they teach to the best of their ability, they flourish, everybody flourishes. So if we can think of the notion of care in an ecology, in the educational ecology, it stretches to all the stakeholders, it stretches to social equity, teachers, communities, parents, and the systems and the buildings that they're working. So mm. putting the notion of care in an ecology in the forefront of our mind will help us keep the big picture in mind, perhaps. That's great, Sarah. And I, if, I mean, maybe a silver lining of this quite horrific crisis is people asking each other, how are you doing? Actually more stop, stop. than perhaps we have done in the past. So I just want to say thank you so much to both of you, Barry, Sarah, for sharing your wonderful insights and, and kind of the takeaways that we can have as we try to build back better and we try to have care as part of the kind of ecological approach we can take forward. Um, all the best with your ongoing work. Um, Barry, you'll be joining for you know, a debrief on the, the repeat time for this call. Um, but Sarah, sending good vibes from Australia to Austria and Barry, all the best um, over there in California. Thanks, Luca. Thank you so much. And thank Thanks, you guys. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful to be with you. So Jen, I'll send, I'll send it back to you just to close us out. And, um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to host the conversation today. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we are thrilled to be able to say that, uh, as I said, anyone that is looking for um, access to these videos or any of the previous uh, webinars, you can go to knowledgehub.com slash leadership. This is a free 
uh, portal by Knowledge Hook, and uh, you're welcome to sign up for it and access any of the resources that are there. And uh, we've got great news. We've got another uh, social and emotional learning global leadership series coming up on June the 1st. And our host will be Giancarlo Brotto. And the topic will be SEL equity and the human connection. So uh, looking forward to that. And the registration will be up for that on that site uh, in the next day or two. So a huge thanks to Luca, uh, an outstanding job as a host, no surprise there. And to Barry and Sarah, a great conversation. Thanks to all of you participating. We've got some great comments on the chat line. Have a good day and stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen.